now move to our uh, last session and a very important session for today is a panel discussion. So we will invite uh, Tabitha and Dana join the panel with two other speakers. Tabish, a uh, partner from uh, Ernest and Young, and uh, Mark, Director uh, Security Solution Architecture from Royal Bank of Canada. All right, so uh, everybody, here's our great panel, and uh, I will be your panel moderator to basically ask questions and also look at your question and on behalf of you ask them. So can you quickly introduce yourself, maybe 30 seconds or a minute uh, to what you do there? So let's start, maybe, uh, Tavisha, you, you, you can start first. Sure, thank you very much, Brian, and, and good evening, everybody, and I guess good afternoon for, for those of you joining from the West Coast. Uh, my name is Tavish Gill, and, and Brian, as much as uh, Brian, you provided a good introduction, I'm a partner at EY based out of Toronto and part of the technology risk uh, solution offering here. Uh, prior to that, I've spent a significant amount of time in another firm, but also the last four years inside a large bank. Uh, particularly RBC running the global cyber and tech audit team and aside from running tech and audit and covering uh, various aspects of digital transformation and cyber risk across the organization across the global organization I was also involved in leading a digital transformation for the risk and assurance functions and how do we actually measure uh, build and, and draft and get better assurance across our technology and cyber risk across the organization as a, as a line three three lines of defense model so I'm happy to be here and share my experiences as part of this panel. Uh, thank you, Brian. Very good, uh, Tabish. Uh, Mark, uh, can you do a quick intro about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good day to everybody. Uh, I like to say good day because you never know what time somebody's coming from. So instead of reading <laughs> all of them, I just say good day. Uh, my name is Mark Precision. I'm a director of security solution architecture at RBC. Um, I've been in the game of cybersecurity and actually also in the IT audit space for well over 19 years. I, I, I've worked everywhere from the, the audit firms and working with some, some of the big ones and some of the small ones, as well as getting involved in from an operations perspective and a governance perspective from security. So I've kind of done the gambit of everything from setting up security programs to maturing security programs. And just being involved in security programs and and at RBC now, I, I spend more time looking at the future of, of, of this and, and what is that next level of digital transformation? Not just where are we going, but, you know, at, at the beginning and, and the minor changes, but now moving into kind of the what's way down the future that nobody else is thinking about. Because luckily, a place like RBC, we have that opportunity to start looking way in the future and not just looking at what's coming at us in six months or a year from now. Perfect. Uh, the industry trends and the where we are going, uh, those are also very, very important. All right. And Dana and uh, Tabitha, uh, I introduced you guys so, uh, before, but uh, if you want to share a quick, like uh, 30 seconds about yourself, something interesting, feel free to go. And uh, Tabitha, you want to do first? Um, I moved out of the consulting um, assurance roles and went into the operational role. And I have to say, it's a little bit refreshing after a few years of uh, doing the assessments to actually do the doing. So it's it's kind of nice to do again. So yeah, on the other side of the I'm world, the architect now. your previous work. <laughs> Great. And Dana? Okay. Not sure how much okay. is, is interesting about me, but I, I will tell you my my formal training is in finance, right? My my training isn't really in in IT. I've spent most of my career in consulting, but I I think about I think even the the security world. As you guys saw my presentation about. All of this is about to support supporting the business and, and, you know, I, I think in terms of kind of uh, money for lack of a better term. Right? And, and so, um, hopefully I, I can kind of provide a, a different point of view around uh, the way cybersecurity fits into to why we're doing it. Perfect. That's also very important because uh, we need a different perspective because the cybersecurity is a big topic, cyber risk, all those. And uh, all of you from have a rich background uh, experience. So really we can kind of share with our audience your uh, profound insights. All right, so I will start a couple of my questions. Then I also look at people when you submit questions on the chat, I will use that to ask our panel, panel members. And so, first of all, let's set up the stage. 
So today's topic is for the whole event, we talk about uh, strategy uh, for uh, digitization, trans digital transformation, or cyber. So uh, I like to ask our panel members, what's your view on the digital transformation and the cyber? What does that, what, are, what do those two terms uh, mean to you? Uh, maybe I can start with Mark first. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when I hear digital transformation, the first thing I have to think about is, is what is the company that's thinking about this? Um, because it, it means different things to different organizations. If you're a, a company that does a lot of things on paper, well, digital transformation may actually be going to online forms. But for some organizations, it could even be things, you know, moving to the cloud or moving into an infrastructure as code, as Tabitha kind of talked about earlier, uh, and, and starting to, to evolve from just having a couple servers to now, you know, having containers and having all of this weird and wonderful new technologies that we have. And, and the digital transformation really is that path to getting there. How, how are we going to get on our journey? And then the cyber aspect is, well, it's, it's the same as it's always been. How do we keep us ourselves safe and keep ourselves out of trouble as we head down that path? Wonderful. Uh, anyone else want to add to that? Uh, view? I, mean, I, I can add something. I mean, one thing I will say, and, and uh, I'm going to put some words in, in Ernst & Young's or in EY's mouth, but um, EY did a study uh, a couple of years ago on what they called digital masters, and, and they wanted to see what was the actual monetary effect on digital transformation? Those that actually did digital transformation best. And the interesting thing was the people that did it best, people that they called digital, digital masters, they increased revenue in the business by about 6%. And the people that did it poorly decreased revenue by 6%. The interesting thing was the people that did it best actually increased profitability by 24%. And those that did it poorly lost profitability by about 23%. So what does it tell you? It tells you that the reason we're doing digital transformation is because it is about a better customer experience. And not only that, you are not only making more money, but you are taking the money directly out of the, of the peer, of your peers and your competitors and putting them at financial risk. So when I think about digital transformation, it's all about, as an example, if I'm working with amazon.com, I'm either uh, shopping at Whole Foods and interacting with that service. I'm buying something online, interacting with that service. I'm working in AWS. I'm, I'm working at Amazon in the district. I have a guy delivering, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the service is, whether I'm an employee or I'm a contractor, digital transformation is all about making that experience seamless to the end user without them understanding that they only have just enough to do what, what they're there to do and no more. Very interesting view. And uh, we start to talk about money, talk about experience, and uh, those are very, very important foundation uh, items for digital transformation and the cyber. Um, anyone else want to, to add to that? Yeah, Brian, the only thing I'll maybe add, and I think Dana and Tabitha and Mark have covered it well, I mean, digital transformation in essence is the use of, I'll call it technology for the sake of, for the sake of uh, you know, naming off different types of technology for all the purposes that, that you covered there, right? So at, at the utmost, it's about providing better customer or employee experiences, creating efficiencies as a part of that. Uh, naturally, every for-profit organization wants to make money. So there's an element of, can we do this better to improve our profit margins uh, or attract more customers or market share, right? So, so those are always things, but I, I think more and more in recent years, what you're also starting to see digital transformation and that could be a real anchor for better risk management across the organization, better compliance posture. Uh, but, but as I say that from one side of my mouth and as, as a partner in a consulting firm, uh, well, what I also tend to see is that, you know, introducing additional or new technologies and new concepts in an organization is also increasing risk in, in many facets and some of which we're here to talk about today. Uh, so there's a fine balance between accomplishing and wanting to accomplish all those things, including better risk management or compliance postures, but at the same time opening a new can of worms when it comes to the risk facing the organization. And most of those are broader than tech and cyber. There's a significant people risk element, and that's also involved, which I'm sure we'll talk about during the course of the evening. Yeah, and, I, and I'd agree with that, Tanish. I mean, you're you're looking at when you look at digital transformation, it could be a great thing, or it can be a horrible thing. I think, you know, Dana, Dana's got it right. You know, you, you could increase your profits or you could lose. Uh, and not only could you lose, you, you, not only from a financial perspective, a people's perspective, a customer perspective, 
you know, it, it, there's pluses and minuses to it. And, I, and I've kind of seen both ends where when it goes well, it goes really well. But when it goes bad, oh boy, does it hurt. I will say from lots of experience, digital transformations are usually um, driven from the top without necessarily a lot of concept of what it takes to make that organizational shift and you, without understanding the impact on the user and or the people who have to support. And so there's always a set of internal resistance to that change that has to be overcome. So I'll always say that there's a huge HR aspect and it's not just inside the organization, it's the entire ecosystem that works with that organization. And sometimes it's the customers. If you've not brought them along, they're not going to do it. So you've got to consider that digital transformation is an organizational change effort. It's the training of the people involved. It's also the training of the users. There's some big flops, not because it was a bad product or because it was a bad website, but because you didn't bring your users along and there was a revolt and that that's a hard set. So from a cyber perspective, there's risks involved in that. Yeah, and I think you're starting, you're seeing that in, in Canada, at least with some companies that have gone to self-service checkouts, right? If you look in the news lately, the companies that have been very careful in their messaging and, and, and their advertising of introduction of these technologies, it has not been a problem for them, but others who just kind of did it in the background and didn't really let the customer know why it was happening or what was going on, did not go so well, that, and they've had damage control and PR issues that they've had to deal with because of that. Mm -hmm. All right, since we already touched on that topic, so uh, actually that's lead to my next questions uh, regarding, all right, so we have a digital transformation, digitization. What are some common cyber risks and challenges during that journey? Right. So I think, uh, uh, Tabitha, in your presentation, you already covered some of those. Uh, so I'd like to hear your, uh, like, a, the thoughts. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to add one that I didn't put in. That's training. There is a lack of training in the new uh, way of doing things. So like I talked about infrastructure as code. Well, that means that the risk person has to understand how to read code. That means the infrastructure person needs to understand how to write code. The, the training involved is, is, is tough. It's tough on people like myself who are in the older range to keep up with that. So, again, this is going to be a change management. It's going to be, how do I make sure I encourage my current folks to grow in the way I want them to grow? Because the other thing is, there's not a lot of resources out there in cyber to pick up. You're not going to find them. You're going to find people coming out of school who don't have the skill sets either. So, um, you know, that's one thing in cyber that's, that's tough that we didn't talk about. And it's a risk because you have untrained people trying to manage cybersecurity or assurance, uh, the assurance chain. They just don't have the skills. That's a great uh, insight because uh, we tend to use a lot of um, uh, latest uh, hot terms. That matters is your trust or all those things. But uh, oftentimes, many people still don't fully understand what it's about, right? So, but you, you just add those terms there. Uh, how can you implement that? One of the slides uh, Dana put, I, I remember there's a, when you, when you need a, a zero trust, you need identity. You need identity, you need a kind of like a chain. But if you couldn't even achieve the basic, how can you achieve that one? So that's actually very good. Anyone want to add to the common risk and the challenges? Yeah, I'd actually put a little bit of a twist on what Tabitha was talking about there and talk about, you know, the reticence and, and the, the, the lack of training that some of your regulators and your auditors may have as well in these tech in these things. So you might as a company be moving forward with it, but you're, if you're in a highly regulated industry, that regulator may not get it. And so you might have a real challenge of making sure that that regulator understands what's, what you're trying to do and communicating that, yes, we are still implementing the proper security controls. And yes, we are doing all these things to make sure that they, they, they get comfortable with what you're trying to do and where you're moving. 
um, because you know sometimes they just they they know this is this is my checklist, and I'm not saying this is every every auditor and every regulator. I get to poke fun because I always say I was an auditor. <laughs> checklists, um, you know, uh, but it, it 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 can be a real challenge to make sure that not only do the people in your organization know where you're going, not only that your customers know where you're going, but where the regulators and and your outside governance organizations know where you're where things are going and and how to get there very cool yeah mark you touched on it touched and you have to touch on it. i spoke about it earlier i think the people risk element is huge as part of digital transformation and you know i, I sort of go back to it introduces cyber risk and, and training is certainly a component of that but one other thing i think this is pretty big today at least in my mind and i've seen this in different organizations even inside a large organization that operates in different geographies and different countries around the world is real holistic governance and oversight uh, of all the risks that, that are there. And uh, in many ways, that's caused by just different players coming and playing, the, the playing, sitting at the table at different times of the day and for different flavors of the subject. Uh, you, you know, and, and that's just the way you know, large organizations are organized where everybody has a distinct role to play and, and that's their sort of their tunnel vision. Uh, where I think leading organizations or better organizations are managing or, or attempting to manage this risk better is by having sort of a group of people at the table, whether it's a steering committee or, or, or a bunch of champions uh, looking at the project holistically. And, and that sort of also goes back to the question around, I mean, we're constantly faced in the audit and risk and compliance world. Uh, there's always a, there's a, oh, I've seen a pendulum swing, right? Once there's a, well, you need a lot more technical training. And then the other side of it, where you need to be more audit and assurance focused, you can't have everybody that knows security at you know doing audits. But I think that the, I think the right medium is somewhere in the middle, or you need a combination of skill sets. But there's a lot of people across the organization that you know if you bring them together can actually truly help you uncover and, and uh, uncover and provide a holistic view of risks facing the organization versus when we sit and do it in our individual silos and don't actually have a clue what's happening on the other side of the wall. So. I go back to governance and oversight and, and having more of a holistic view of risk, I think is that it continues to be a big challenge that we see in organizations or, or we start to see gaps where we're brought in to help address or help solve the problems. Yeah, I mean, I think you have, uh, you have the over entitlement problem and I do a lot of, of work on role mining, et cetera. So the over entitlement problem is one that's near and dear to my heart, but organizations that are trying to get to the rule of least privilege they're combating 40 years of the free for all, right? Where everyone could just get whatever they wanted to get and admin stuff on here and blah, blah, blah. And to unwind that is not easy. And the, the second part of this is that, you know, we're trying to get to a world in which we can auto provision users and give them what they need before they even ask for it. A lot of problems here is that's reliant now on HR data being up to date and being, being triggerable. And when everybody in your organization is a, a programmer one, and that's only done because HR doesn't want to deal with a reorg and have to go back and look at their HR data. What do I trigger off of? Right. So there's all these efficiencies that we can go after inside of from a digital transformation perspective and zero trust perspective. But unless the business aligns um, and, and they recognize that your problems are in fact my problems, um, that, that it's the internal hustle and bustle that I, I really um, I see a lot as big a detractor from allowing organizations to get where they need to get. Well, and I think that's that that's very interesting point because you know one of the biggest cyber risks is not knowing where your business is going. If you don't know where your business is headed as a cybersecurity professional, forget it. You know, you're just you're never going to be able to actually get in front of it. You're not going to be able to be there. So if and and Tavish kind of mentioned it. If you don't, you need to get a seat at the table at the and I think Tabitha said it too. You need a seat at the table at the beginning. If you don't have it at the beginning, you're playing catch up. And when you're playing catch up, you're missing things. And that's where you start to have incidents and you start to have problems. So, so I actually used to do governance for mergers and acquisitions. And um, that was risk management and security and privacy. So my role was to sit on front prior to the acquisition to get on front of what are we buying? Why are we buying it? What's the intent of buying this? And understand what they had. And if I wasn't there, which happened before, like before I was put in that position, that had actually happened. We had a unfortunate incident 
associated with we purchased something that actually got us into trouble because it was doing something that they shouldn't have. And now you own this. So you want to minimize that risk up front prior to the acquisition. So, but if I'm not at that table, if you don't have that person up at that table to understand what it is that you're doing, now you're going to get yourself into trouble. So right. this is so to say cybersecurity is a you know flipping the buttons, putting the plugs in, or just writing applications. That's not what cybersecurity is. It's at being strategically at the table in the decisions and being able to influence, not make, make, say yes or no, but to influence the, the decision on the risk. And I, you can't I, do it sitting in the background. Yeah, I, I can, I don't know how, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count the number of times that I've been at the table and said, uh, have you thought about this risk in doing this? Oh, no, I didn't realize that that would be a problem. Okay. <laughs> Now let's work through that, you know, and helping them understand it and helping them figure all that out. So I keep he hearing that a lot of uh, on the training education side, the people understanding and uh, kind of communicate with the different multiple teams. And I also see several uh, questions from our audience, uh, like uh, basically related to what we just discussed. I think one of the questions from Carlos about uh, in Canada, uh, or like, uh, what is what do you think is the biggest business security problem? So we talk about risk. So <laughs> of course, each person has different view, but uh, I'm, I'm actually going to say this isn't problem. just a Canadian problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. It, it, this is uh, a, a truly a world <laughs> problem. Which is uh, no, I'm I'm actually going to lean more towards um, knowing what you have. Exactly. What is my inventory of data, of equipment, of applications? Yeah. Who has it? Where is it? You name it. Because, Nobody knows. Yeah, I think, you know, Dana mentioned it, shadow IT, always a big problem because somebody, especially nowadays, right? How easy is it to, and I'm not going to pick on Tabitha, but how easy is it to get on Azure with a credit card and build right. a solution? It's pretty easy. It's great that you can do that because, hey, you're great and agile, but now you've got a big risk, right? And the security guys didn't know that, hey, that guy over in finance went and built a Power BI application. Now that's sitting out there. Oh, okay. How do we secure that now? How do we peel that back and make sure that we know what's there and, and, and keep it secure? So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't look at it as just a Canada problem. Uh, I've worked for multinationals where I had to look at all this stuff and you know, yeah, you've got country specific challenges usually with the laws around around certain things that you can and cannot do. But realistically, the same problems exist from a cyber perspective everywhere, making sure you know where stuff is, making sure you understand the identity of all of this stuff, be it the, the assets, the people, whatever. It's always the same challenge. By the okay, way, Mark, we didn't really go ahead. I was just going to say. The way to control the example that you said is by identity. You can't connect into the uh, organization without having excellent identity controls, even from an application perspective. Right. And, and tap that you just touched exactly what I was going to say. I think IT, I call it an IT asset management problem, and I think it's bigger bigger than IT asset management. Whether it's data, technologies, whatever you want to call it, I, I think part of it is knowing where your data is. But the, the other thing that's sort of really emerging out of it as a byproduct is the third party, fourth party, fifth party, sixth party. You got it. Customers and customers, that, partners and partners. Yeah, exactly. And, and trying to stay on top of that is, you know, if, if somebody has figured that out, then I've not known many people to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all ears because I, I think a lot of times what we don't realize being inside an organization is that, you know, our data is not just going to the, the partner that, that we have agreed to, to do business with us. There's a third, fourth, fifth, sixth party involved. And I've not seen anything personally go beyond a sixth party, but I'm sure they are around the world. But I've seen this relationship when you really start uncovering, there are fifth and sixth parties involved in a relationship, uh, which, which you never uncover at any initial conversation, or I'll say even deeper conversations or diligence or assessments. So this is, this is sort of the web that, that we're living in today. Uh, and and I, this is a global problem. This is not a Canada problem. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so we 
discuss uh, quite many areas about the digital transition, uh, digital transformation, cyber concept, risk challenges. We actually also touch on some like uh, how do we integrate cyber into business and the kind of uh, how that will help with the business. So back to the strategy part. So uh, in I think uh, Tabitha, in your presentation, you mentioned several frameworks. Uh, of course, there's different uh, other practice. So the question I have for the panel is. How can we build a sound uh, or like a reasonable cyber strategy? Uh, so, any tips you can share with the audience? Um, I, I wouldn't mind starting on that one. Um, I'm a huge proponent of the basics uh, with any cybersecurity program. So, have an inventory of your technologies and your service providers. You need to have a good, strong patching program. And you need to make sure that you're keeping your identity management systems clean. So, you know, and by clean, I mean, removing people when they leave. And making sure that you take away access when people move. Right. I think really a lot of companies are really good at that adding a new person and removing a person when they leave, but they're terrible about when somebody transitions to another role. So if you get those basics in place. Then you can start looking at all the cool cybersecurity toys out there, like zero trust, like um, you know uh, some of the, some of the other new you know quantum computing, all that fun stuff that's coming down the road. But if you don't have the basics, it doesn't matter how much other stuff you have because somebody's going to find a way to break in. I think right. you know, the basics. Yeah. I'll yeah. Because I'm a big big fan of frameworks as a whole and call it NIST or or others. I think they provide a good guidance to basically what you said, the basic hygiene or the areas that one can question. I mean, CIS top 20 is out there, NIST is out there. And, and funny enough, all of those things sort of start with uh, what are your assets, <laughs> right? Yes. Do you know your assets? So, do you know your data flows? Do you know your partners, your supply chain? And then you could get into other things, right? Like you, you said, basic stuff, your configurations up to par, your patching, your, your change management process, your backup, your recovery. And so, interestingly enough, right, there, there used to be a stat, and I used to quote it all the time, like 90% of the breaches or major cyber events are a result of basic, what I call basic hygiene area that we just talked about here. So, like, go figure, if you want to spend 80% of your time focusing on 90% of the things that cause breaches, you've got a pretty good playbook and to start with and keep you busy for the next 10 years. Uh, but anyways, these, these things are still uh, surprising to me, both from an audit risk management perspective. How we continue to file, find holes in those processes when these things should be sort of the basic of what we do as IT and cyber professionals. Yeah, I mean, to piggyback on that, I would say, like, yeah, when you I mentioned this earlier, but when you look at the virus called Stuxnet that took down the entire Iranian nuclear capability, the way it started, first of all, the virus was ingenious, used a bunch of zero day exploits, et cetera. But the way it started was through a USB drive. It just, I mean, it was, it's that simple, right? It would have never happened had they not had someone just take a USB drive and stick it in his or her machine, right? And so the low hanging fruit in cybersecurity has a lot of juice. Just because it seems like it's that easy doesn't mean it's not worth doing. I look at, you know, I, I focus on role mining a lot and role based access control. I, I can account for probably 30% of uh, any of your users' access simply by knowing that they're an employee. If they're active or inactive, what department they're in and what location they're in. That's simple stuff. And, and if I figure out the people that, that are operate out of, the, of a certain location, the people that have the highest turnover with the biggest job title, let's start there. Make it an ROI based role mining program. I mean, there are parts of, of cybersecurity that can be ROI based. And so it's not just that it's a cost center for you, you can show efficiency gains. If you have better roles, people don't request access because they're already getting it in the first place, which means you're saving the business money. So I think there is a way for us to, to um, identify and prioritize cybersecurity uh, activities simply by just looking at the money it's actually saving the business. And, and it's easy to get executives on board when you can show them an ROI of, of what is traditionally a cost center. So one of the things I, I think I, I hear missing in all the discussion right now is great to do the hygiene, et cetera, that doesn't give us our strategy. Um, great point. You have to look at the strategy as to what is the business objectives. When you, again, sitting on that strategic, annual strategic and every three years and five years strategic discussions with the business leaders to say, 
we're looking at doing a merger and acquisition in this area. We're looking at turning over our OT, IT, uh, IOT and SCADA systems. Uh, we're looking at uh, tracking GPSs uh, in our trucks and our cars to make sure that our employees, are the cars don't get stolen or that we have the least uh, whatever, or we're moving all to electronic cars. We wanna be able to track where they are and make sure that we, we get, you need to know that so that it's from a strategic perspective that you're investing in the right areas. You have to do that hygiene. There's no if, ands, or but. That's that's what I call table stakes. That does not get you to your strategic objectives. Same thing with your identity. It is table stakes. What is our strategy? Our strategy has to be how can we optimize the business objectives? How can we do it in such a way is that we don't lose the reputation of the business as we do it. Our, the data that our customers, that our employees, uh, you know, trust us with. We have to obtain that trust, but we have to support that business. If we're not doing it, we're a roadblock. Um, one of the other things I would think about with this as well, though, is, um, and, and you're 100% right uh, on that, Tabitha, is, you know, being knowing where the business is going and what they're doing is, is key to you developing your strategy. But as a cybersecurity person as well, I also need to understand my own tactical approach to things. So I, I would also look at stuff like, you know, hey, do I, especially with the way SaaS is going and, and, and all of that, do I want to be an ecosystem or best of breed approach when I deploy my technologies? Um, it, there's pluses and minuses to both sections of that and, and how you do it, but it's got to be part of that strategy because, you know, you could say like, hey, I'm going to do identity and hey, I'm going to do this and hey, I'm going to do zero trust and I'm going to do, you know, secure web gateways in the clouds. But how do I pull that together and how do I make it all work? becomes right. a question of how do you want to do it? Do you really want to go breed or do you want to go ecosystem? Yeah. How much is it going to cost me to manage 50 or 60 best of breeds? Yeah. Do how I want... do I keep my people trained up to do 50, 60 best of breeds? Do I focus on, you know, five best of breeds and then an ecosystem to provide the platform? Those are strategic goals that you also have to understand. And there's a cost to each one. Absolutely. And uh, Tabish, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I was just trying to say, guys, like, you know, one of the things that we, we often hear from, from our clients, particularly the C-suite across organizations, is that, hey, you know, as a, from a consulting standpoint, thank you for bringing organizational knowledge to me. And I always sort of find that very interesting because they say, hey, you guys have a better view of what's happening across our organization than we do, and we live inside the organization. And a lot of times, this is a factor of knowing different things that are happening in different parts of the organization. It's our business to get to know what each of the players are doing and, and really bring that knowledge together to, to help the organization move forward or address specific problems. And Tabitha, you mentioned I, I used to run the tech and cyber risk due diligence practice in a, in a previous consulting firm. And, you know, that was probably one of the few times I felt that you knew everything that was happening about the business, even when you were thinking Absolutely. about an acquisition. And you were on a retainer, uh, right? Because these things happen and move so quickly. You knew the strategy, you knew the parts of the business, the organization was focused on the geographical region, where it ties in, how will it integrate? What assets are you trying to bring? What people will you keep? What will you remove, right? How will you integrate? Now, if you were to just really flip that and you didn't do that, you know, acquisition to acquisition or transaction to transaction versus you focus on doing that within your organization, creating that knowledge, I think we would all be in that different place. So. It does come back to the business strategy. And I think Mark alluded to it earlier. Sometimes, you know, somebody like me, I take a lot of interest in knowing what the next three to five year strategy is, knowing very well that in the next three years, that strategy will change drastically. Uh, but, you know, everything has to be aligned to this is where the organization is going. Sometimes we're very short sighted uh, in looking at what this technology is meant to address. I've seen many, many programs fail. DLP programs come to mind where somebody says, let's go buy all the bells and the whistles and the minute Tavish sends an email outside the organization, it'll be classified and we'll, we'll track it. It shouldn't go out. Now, the problem is people forgot to train Tavish that he has to classify emails, <laughs> right? So there's there's always a hint. So why are we doing this? It, it's also key versus, hey, let's not jump at the very best thing that's out there and grab it and hopefully it'll help our organization. But we have to be a little bit more strategic about this. And maybe emails and documentation as a process is going away. So if you sat back at it five years ago, 
We don't send documents out to clients in most consumer business through an email channel anymore. So maybe that wasn't the best investment and, and, and thinking through what do we do from a cloud perspective or from an online collaboration technology and storage spaces are a big challenge for me or where I see as an in, within organization. So again, looking at the strategy ahead from a business standpoint where the business wants to go is absolutely key for every tech and cyber risk professional. I also think and 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 uh, Tabish, you, you generated a, a thought in my head is is um you always when you're doing and looking for new products and new solutions and things like that as part of your strategy, don't don't just go with whatever the gartners or the the foresters of the world tells you is the best product. You gotta find the product that's right for you and and the solution that's right for you. Uh it's you know, because you're right, you know, I I've seen a bunch of programs where they bought products, put them in. Best thing on the market, great. Doesn't work for my organization. It doesn't fit my organization and what we're trying right. to do with it. So it didn't fit. So therefore it was a paperweight that cost me a lot of money. And now I got to throw that out and I got to find a way to find the right thing to put in so that my organization continues to work. Uh, because if part of your strategy is don't be a hindrance, then you, you, you're missing something, right? You, you don't want to be a blocker as part of, uh, uh, for the business because they'll either ignore you or you won't be there much longer. Great. Uh, Mark, you can actually catch on our next question. So I'd like to ask uh, our panel quickly comment, uh, how can we leverage the modern technologies? Uh, it could be Prada or kind of uh, like a cloud, all those things to improve the performance of the cyber risk management and the cyber security. I would say, you know, and I'm going to keep it kind of general here is, is, you know, leverage the technologies in, in, in the way you need to. So, you know, uh, build your service catalogs and build your, your services it, that leverage these technologies in a way that's easy for your end users to, to access and understand. Um, because again, at the end of the day, security is a service and if it can't be used well, then you're going to have problems. And, and if people don't know how to access your teams and talk to your teams, you're going to get bogged down in the mire. You're not going to be able to be really efficient. Um, you know, because it's going to be, Hey, hey Tabish, um, can you help me with this? Oh, no, I, I, I can't help you with that. Go ask Tabitha. Oh, Tabitha says, oh, no, no, that's not me. Go ask, go ask Dana because Dana's the one that deals with uh, the identity side of things. So he probably has a better, uh, better way to do it. Well, you've just bogged down four people. So those four people can't work on other things to keep cybersecurity nicely, you know, nicely humming along and, and not getting gummed up in all the works. Yeah, I, I would say this goes back to Tabitha's, Tabitha's point about having a strategy. Understand what the hub is is going to be in your organization of your cybersecurity strategy. Obviously, I would argue it, it's identity. But one thing I would say uh, on the identity tools is being inside of SailPoint. There was a very interesting moment that happened to me where I realized that there's it's not enough to be smart about how you're doing things. AI, ML, that's all about those applications are all about being smart. But we can also be clever in the way that we operate inside of cybersecurity. As an example, I can tell you peer group analysis of what I think a person should have based on all their other peers and use all this cool data science to figure out what maybe should go into a role. But you know what also tells me what should be in a role? When a guy gets a new job and he requests something within three days of getting that job, probably needs it in the end of the role, right? He's enabling him or herself to go do their job. So. Right. We can start to be clever about things. And if a person is extending their access, allow them to click a button that says, this should be part of my role, right? Really basic stuff that I think, because we think about this on a daily basis, it, it, you know, that's where leveraging the tools, leveraging the ability of the tool itself to, to figure out how to be smart and when to be clever really helps you get further along. And you can then, I think, put a, a larger um, reliance on those tools and, and when you allow yourself to put a reliance on those tools, that's when you really see the benefit. Because what happens is your teams, as an example, in the role mining, your role mining team isn't role definition people. It's a it's a role program maintenance team. 
the business deals with role with role evolution and everything else. Right. These people now have a very fundamentally different role. And that's where I think, you know, it, it all goes back to Tabitha's point about have a strategic objective, understand what your goals are and everything else. That roadmap will start to fall in place once you understand where it is you're going and what it is you need to support. Yeah, and then the only thing I'll add to that, I, I think you guys have all covered it well, is that, you know, what I typically see, in both from an industry standpoint and what I saw inside a large bank and what I've seen in consulting roles for, for many years is that, you know, often we try to strap on technology or new tools or uh, new capabilities because it's the hot, sexy, flashy stuff. And if we say that will get us some dollars, get the organization excited. And, and at times we lose sight of the fact that we, we should try to address the root cause versus the problem of the day, right? So it, it goes back to, you know, root cause is, is kind of like an audit terminology where we say, well, well, what caused this to happen, right? And it's always easy, very hard to discover and nail down. Uh, but at the end of the day, there, there's a reason or that, that has happened. And, and so we don't often try to address the reason versus try to create better processes so you, you you talked about the identity. I mean, even using that as an example, you know, for years I've kind of dealt with that. Let's fix the way we grant access. Let's the way fix the way we attest. Let's fix the way we hand, handle transfers. But sometimes what we really haven't really spent a whole lot of time is better role definition, thinking about birthrights as you talked about, and make birthright will differ business to business, function to function, and taking the onus out of operations to manage some of these things versus defining them with the business up front. And going back to educating the business about conflicts and, and so on and so forth, not when audit discovers something or a regulator discovers something versus when we're initially building those. And Tab, I see a big grin on your face, so I know this is resonating. Uh, but, you know, this is just identity is just another example of where often technology is sort of strapped on or thrown on to say, hey, maybe let me go get a better tool. Maybe I'll get a better privilege access management tool that'll help solve the problem. But I haven't. Actually, fundamentally changed the processes that caused me, or that were the root cause of the problem to begin with, which is often people <laughs> defining these roles or lack there of defining these roles, right? I think, like we talked about earlier, right? There's there's good things that can be done with technology, and then there's bad things that can be done with technology. Um, so you have to be careful when you're using these new modern technology tools that you don't go down the bad path. All right, very good. And um, we are actually getting closer to the uh, ending of this uh, panel. Uh, we already uh, talk about almost like a uh, forty-five minutes and a great uh, talk on different areas like a uh, concept, the risk, uh, the the best of practice, strategy, technology. To wrap up our discussion, I actually uh, responded to a couple of questions people submit online. And one of the key messages I received from today's session is the training, right? So several speakers are, are mentioned that one. So from the talent development point of view, so each of you guys uh, are, have a very successful uh, career. You, you experience all kind of history, current, and uh, you also uh, kind of predict the future. So can you share with our audience, uh, maybe you are top one, like a number one tip or from speaking of the career development, how can we better educate, uh, better develop our uh, cyber talent? Um, so that could be uh, the one we wrap up today's uh, panel. Uh, anyone want to start? I mean, in educating uh, your user base and that, it, it, it's key to be clear. Don't get too techno babbly. Don't get too, um, you know, in the weeds on certain things. You make sure that you're you're speaking to your audience uh, when you're educating them. So the the IT operations guys, yeah, go down to that technical level. Talk about ACLs. Talk about all that fun stuff. But when you're talking to some business users in finance, they don't. They don't know what an ACL is. They they know that there's a thing that allows that a thing that's stopping me from doing something. So you know, explaining to them this is why those things exist helps them understand better, versus the technology person who probably really wants to understand what that technology control is and how it actually works. So targeting your education is, is key. Right. 
Brian, I, I, I often answer this in a different context when people are looking to change careers or, or get a job, no matter what organization or you're providing some, some call it mentorship uh, to our people. And, and I think those both experienced people and, and people just coming out of school or early on in their career, and it often comes back to three things for me. And, and those are things like curiosity, courage, and, and competency, right? So uh, the, the curiosity part is I, I think that the development and growth is you have to, in our world, in, in tech, in cyber, in risk, in security, you have to have an ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, focus on curiosity. If you're not curious, you will not uncover different things. So this, I think this is a basic thing you have to bring to this profession. Uh, secondly, courage when I talk about, so you have to have the courage to want to try and tackle some things. Uh, you heard from uh, Tabitha in particular, and Mark in particular, and myself as my own example. We all have a very diverse background and we probably come from very similar, we probably started in very similar areas in our career and we're in very different three fields today of, of the three that, that I know well. Uh, and, and then the competency part is you always have a competency to bring to the table, uh, but you know, the, you, Confidence is about continuous development and growth. You have to continue to develop additional competencies to keep yourself relevant. And it's a bit of a building block thing. It's not like you have one and then you let go of it and pick up another thing. You've seen from all of our collective experiences that this is it's a body of experience and work over a period of time that helps you become a better professional, I think, in this field. So that would be my sort of three things to share. And I know I'm long-winded. It's not one thing, but there's a combination of things that, that help and or can continue to help. Bish, I think you're right on. I would also say th building on the curiosity is don't go into cybersecurity or even IT if you aren't ready to continuously learn. <laughs> you right. have to have a learning attitude and you really have to be, uh, be able to say, I'm going to learn on my own. I'm not going to wait till somebody feeds me. I need to feed myself. Um, and without that, like, to be honest, you, 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 it's going to be very, very hard to stay current. I mean, and I mean, stay current. So much happens so fast. Technology changes so fast. You're never going to be know everything in cybersecurity. I don't think any 1 of us knows in depth all yep. of cybersecurity, there's just really no way. We've all picked where we want to be incredibly competent and we realize that we're gonna to have to go to somebody else to get specific depth in other areas. Right. So knowing where you wanna be curious, but knowing that you have to do all that learning on your own, yeah, people will help pay for classes or whatever, but you have to have that initiative inside you to wanna do that. Otherwise, don't go in this field because it's really tough. Yeah, and I suspect for a lot of us on on this call, you know, I I always say to people when they ask me, well, what do you, what do you do? And I say, well, really, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none type of person. Right? <laughs> I know a little bit about everything, and 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 I can figure out what I need to. And when I really need that expert, I will go and find the right person to help me. So you know, I'm not afraid to go and ask the person next to me, hey. I, I don't understand this. Help me out. Here. Right, right. So, you know, you can't be afraid as you grow in your career to say, I don't know. But you have to then follow it up with. How do I find out? Exactly. You got it. You got it. Excellent. I, mean, I, I would say that I think the, the, the. I look at the person dead in the eyes and say, in all fairness, you know, when you go to Home Depot and there's the guy that you buy the hot dog off of for a buck 50. There's a guy that owns 35 of those and he makes a whole lot more money than me. So maybe, maybe you should rethink getting into cybersecurity, right? But I think for those that want to do it, what I would say is you need, love your product, right? Love, love, like if, you, if you're gonna be in cybersecurity at Tim Hortons, I hope you love donuts, right? Because you'll be better at it if you, if you do that. And like for those that choose to work at Microsoft, you love Microsoft products. I love SailPoint products. You know, like even the consultancies, like, you know, you work at a place because you like the way that they deliver that product. And I think it goes back to being genuinely interested and curious and um, understanding risk, but all of that comes down to an appreciation of love of, of the, the core competency you're protecting with the crown jewels, which whether it's donuts or shoes or, or it's your own software, whatever it is, 
I think that's the thing that the, the one piece of advice I would give as a cybersecurity professional is just love love what you do, you know, and love the love the baby because you're protecting the baby. That's your that's your whole point. If you don't love the baby, what's the point of you are going to be good at it, you know? And I think that's the the catalyst that makes people really um, go for it. Perfect. So thank you very much for all your tips uh, about the career development, uh, how do you keep your passion and uh, how to keep your like a uh, continuous learn and uh, what's your like uh, your way to address the, the the problem, how do you solve the problem? So all those are very important. And uh, I would say uh, like uh, I think uh, Tabish mentioned that you need to find a mentor or learn from the industry experts. Uh, to our audience, uh, here are our four of our experts. So make sure you connect with them and learn from their insights. All right. So this pretty much wrap up our panel discussion. Uh, once again, thank you very much for our four amazing speakers: Tabitha from Microsoft, Dana from SailPoint, Tabitha from EY, and Mark from RBC. So I like to ask uh, everybody online, give them a virtual applause or pat. Uh, thank you very much for coming to share with your insights.